Mesdames et Messieurs, Ladies and gentlemen, representatives of the international organizations, and Madam, a former president of the Confederation, Madam State Councillor, ladies and gentlemen of the federal parliament, uh, Mr. Federal Judge, uh, ladies and gentlemen, members of the Council of State, uh, former members of the Council of State, uh, Madam uh, at the Cour des Comptes, um, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, municipal councillors of the city of Geneva, ladies and gentlemen, uh, representatives of the federal authorities, cantonal and municipal authorities, honorable rectors and representatives of Swiss universities and high schools, uh, Madam uh, former mayor of Lampedusa, ladies and gentlemen, award winners, honorable members of the academic, administrative and student bodies of the University of Geneva, Madam and uh, gentlemen award winners uh, and uh, dear friends, uh, dear Michel and award winners of the Nobel Physics Prize for 2019. So you realize uh, that this was a wonderful week for the University of Geneva. Extraordinary, as I say, for Geneva and for Switzerland as a whole and the scientific world of uh, Switzerland. Thank you, Michel Mayor, for being here with us uh, today. You had the various conference presses uh, to give uh, today in Spain in particular, but you're here with us in Geneva, so a great thank you to you. So to all of you, a very warm welcome to the DS Academicus 2019 ceremony. Your large presence is an expression of interest, support, and friendship towards our institution, for which we sincerely thank you. This year, we have placed the ceremony of the DS Academicus under the banner of diversity, because to meet the dizzying challenges facing our societies, we need the resources and talents of each and every one of you. And I will come back to this later. You have understood. Uh, this is happy news that has uh, somewhat uh, shaken up this agenda, an extraordinary event for Geneva. On Tuesday at noon, we learned that two researchers from our university, Michel Mayor and Didier Kellos, were awarded uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, for 2019 for their work on exoplanets. Uh, As the author of the Encyclopedia of Extrasolar Planets has so rightly said, it is strange that it took the Nobel Committee more than 20 years to award the prize to them, but exoplanets are so important that it is not the Nobel Prize that honors them, it is the opposite. And it is all of us who are honored today by the presence of uh, Michel Mayo, our university, Geneva, the scientific center of the Lake Geneva region and all of Switzerland. I also turn to the researchers from all fields, and Michel recall this uh, to, a little earlier, to whom uh, we will be awarding honorary doctorates uh, in a few moments, to tell you that uh, this uh, Nobel Prize is also ours, uh, and uh, to testify to the recognition of a university that for many years has made an ambitious uh, challenge to focus on the research built over the long term in the purest spirit of modern universities born in the 19th century. Without uh, further ado, I give the floor to Ms. Yasmin Atlas, Vice President of the University of Geneva Assembly. You have the floor.
Dear colleagues and classmates, dear authorities, dear public, it is obviously an honor for me to be associated as Vice President of the Assembly of the University with the ceremony which is dedicated to diversity. In preparation for this address, I immersed myself uh, in uh, the history of the University of Geneva, a very important uh, book published the year of my birth, and which is a sign, I believe, a common attachment to the institution, to history, and to books, uh, including in their materiality, materiality, rather. And I found in it the following statement. Um, the University of Geneva has not ceased to be the most uh, fanized of the Swiss universities. In 1965, uh, it's a 39.5 percent female students represented twice the national average. In 1980, uh, female students were in the majority for the first time. In 1985, they represented 51.7 percent of the student body, compared to about 36 percent of all Swiss universities. According to the 2018 annual report, the proportion of female students at the University of Geneva recently stood at 61.3%. This strong representation is largely reflected in the assembly, where following this uh, spring's election, eight of 10 seats allocated to the student body are held by these women in the still binary terms of the administrative language. By virtue of its part participatory nature as required by legislation, the assembly is certainly the organ of the institution where diversity is most likely to be expressed. Diversity of gender, as I said, but also diversity of disciplinary backgrounds uh, since all faculties are represented. And above all, diversity of functions. With 45 seats are distributed among the faculty, 20 seats, uh, the teaching and research staff, uh, 10 seats, uh, the student body also 10 seats, and finally, the administrative and technical staff, five seats. I would like to pay tribute here to the commitment of these people, a commitment uh, that all too often unfortunately amounts to a career barrier because uh, uh, there are some difficulties in terms of gender representation. Now, the time devoted to the work of the assembly or the faculty's participatory councils is less time for members of the student body to excel in studies, less time for academics to excel in research, a necessary though not sufficient condition for their survival in the academic world. Through the report issued last uh, spring by its governance committee, the assembly noted the need to give greater value to the work of participatory democracy. And the persons who keep it alive. Um, what history of the university do we want to write for the 21st century? Alongside uh, very moving pages on the admirable epic of the exoplanets, to which I too would like to pay a very sincere tribute. Should we not draw some lines rich in meaning too? on a significant evolution of the institution in terms of diversity and participation, as well as gender equality. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you a very beautiful ceremony. Thank you, Madam Atlas. Uh, Ms. Atlas is uh, currently writing a PhD thesis, and her commitment within the University of Geneva is extremely precious for us, and the words that you have uh, spoken are certainly very enriching, and we will come back to what you have said over the next uh, few weeks and months. Uh, thank you for your commitment. The hyperactive European who intends to remain optimistic, uh, Mr. Cheni Nadji, this is how Le Temps newspaper described you last March. Uh, Seni Naji, after obtaining a master's degree on uh, the European Studies at the Global Studies Institute of the University of Geneva, well, this year you defended your doctoral thesis uh, on the European Union's negotiation strategy towards uh, Switzerland, a topical 
the subject, allow me to congratulate you warmly here for your PhD in international relations. However, the adjective hyperactive did, uh, does not describe your academic work so much or only so much. In 2014, you joined the think uh, tank uh, Swiss uh, Foreign Policy for us. First in charge of the European Division, you recently became its vice president. In the meantime, you also participated in the founding of the Geneva chapter of Operation Libero, a movement to, to defend the values of tolerance and international openness, to use your words. Created by students in Zurich uh, the day after the acceptance of the Against Mass Immigration Initiative. And then this year, you became one of the participants in the debate on the signing of the institutional agreement between Switzerland and the European Union with your proposal drawn up with four hours uh, of 10 concrete proposals to enable Switzerland to break the deadlock. Mr. Cheni Naji, you illustrate this scholarly commitment uh, that goes beyond the walls of the alma mater to enter the arena of Swiss democracy. Mr. Naji, we're very proud of you, and we're very proud to give you the floor. Mr. Rector, ladies and gentlemen, deans, dear professors, dear students, and dear friends, I am very moved and honored to have been invited to speak at the Dies Academicus, uh, uh, rather special, at the University of Geneva. After 10 years of studies here at the university, with a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and recently a PhD in political science, it is uh, first and foremost uh, with a sense of gratitude that I'm addressing you this morning. Indeed, I'm very grateful to the University of Geneva for having offered me throughout this decade, 2010-2020, an ideal working environment and, above all, a place of personal development. In uh, preparing these few words, I recalled a multitude of fond memories uh, that I will summarize as follows. Um, I had uh, uh, the opportunity uh, to meet students from all over the world. I had the pleasure of following a very stimulating courses. And more recently, I had uh, the honor of teaching several seminars of five groups of students. And I realize uh, that I've been able to develop a critical look on the world and to be able to address uh, a number of issues uh, in an interdisciplinary approach with all their complexity. and. I also developed um, the envy to go further and to put my new knowledge and skills uh, uh, to the availability of the city. In 2014, I joined uh, the For Us uh, think tank, uh, and I became the vice president at the beginning of this year. According to me, this uh, think tank uh, is uh, very important. Uh, it actually shows uh, the way the Swiss uh, political uh, landscape is going to develop, but it constitutes, uh, together with the other emerging entities, the premises are for a greater openness of our political system to new ideas. Such ideas are often out of the ordinary and sometimes uh, disruptive. Uh, this is what the For Us uh, think tank does. It uh, generates a certain distrust. Nevertheless, uh, they're useful and necessary, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, there's a lack of uh, creativity amongst uh, the decision makers here in Switzerland. I note that many of the members of the For Us uh, were former students of the University of Geneva, and I have noticed uh, that they had uh, several distinctive characteristics, a sharp critical sense, an ability to move away from conventions when necessary, and most importantly, a good understanding of the logic of today's globalized world. This may only be a coincidence. Nevertheless, I like to think that it was their stay in our institution that developed these good predispositions in them. And I would like the University of Geneva to pursue its efforts uh, to create these uh, talents, uh, polyvalent uh, talents, and think in an or original way outside of the box, and possibly in a disruptive way. The economic and social, and as well as environmental challenges uh, that we have to face in the 21st century are numerous and complex. Uh, and uh, they will require that uh, tomorrow's uh, decision makers um, follow new directions and are more creative. Thank you very much for your attention.
Mr. Naji illustrates one of the values uh, that we want to uphold within the, the university, uh, university that is open uh, based on collaboration with society. And you're a perfect example of this, so thank you very much. The title of alumna or alumnus of the year is an opportunity to highlight the importance of the community of former students who, through their careers, honor our entire institution. Corinne Chaponnier, your doctorate in literature and your degree in political science, uh, both uh, defended at the University of Geneva, first led you on the path of journalism. You were editor-in-chief of the Swiss Women's uh, newspaper, which became Les Mili, then legal columnist for the Journal de Genève. You pursued your career as a television journalist, first in Geneva and then in Brussels. You have written hundreds of articles and reports, but your pen is also that of a writer. We owe you several books, including La Mixité from Infolio, a biography of Henri Dunant, or Les Quatre Coups de la Nuit de Cristal, published by Albin Michel. You know uh, Alma Marta particularly well, first of all. Uh, you have the merit of having undergone a double training uh, there. Uh, you also had the opportunity to turn theory into practice. Uh, since in 2003, the Council of State appoint appointed you as a member of the University Council under the chairmanship of Roger uh, Mayou. You sat on the Council until 2008. Uh, somebody who marked the history of the University of Geneva. Dear Martin Chapignard, I'm pleased to present you on behalf of the University of Geneva and our Alumni Association, the title of Alumna 2019. The floor is yours. Well, I would like to pay a tribute um, to our two uh, Nobel Prize uh, winners, but I can tell you that I'm very honored myself to, to have been de designated as the 2019 alumna on the occasion of this DS under the sign of diversity. To be honest, I had to find out how I, who am not only Swiss, which is Beno, but also Geneva-based, uh, on Swiss on both sides, mother's side and father's side, uh, could participate in uh, this uh, diversity, uh, which is certainly a rarity, but not a singularity, or an interesting variation in the Darwinian sense of diversity. When I started University in Geneva in the 1970s, the men diversity we were aiming for was diversity, uh, gender diversity. Women represented 43% of students at the time, so they were no longer an interesting variation in the Darwinian uh, sense, but they were still a minority. Today, they represent more than 60% of our student population, which not only shifts uh, the minority group from one gender to another, but also changes uh, the very concept of uh, gender beyond uh, mixity. So it is not uh, the case of uh, defending a girl's access to higher education, as happened in the previous century, but uh, to uh, defend uh, gender equality and uh, any difference uh, is actually favorable and profitable for the society as a whole. There is another diversity that should be upheld, and that is uh, the subjects uh, that are taught. And uh, we see that uh, various disciplines have been taught over time in the former university. Theology and uh, law were very important. In 1850, there was another faculty that was created for the arts and sciences. When uh, the Faculty of Medicine was opened 25 years, uh, five year, 25 years later, James Fuzzy asked uh, that be created a Faculty of Social Sciences. He didn't uh, get his way, and this was a, a failure, in fact, uh, of uh, the failure of uh, precise sciences in the following century. During my studies, I had the privilege of attending two faculties uh, that uh, familiarized me over four years with more than 100 subjects. Uh, we were then in the post-68 decade where the human sciences were in a state of grace, a kind of flamboyant Indian summer that gradually faded in the following decades. And the premise of diversity at university seems to me to include 
the committed protection of rare disciplines, uh, the so-called soft sciences, uh, human, social, and literary sciences, without uh, which uh, knowledge would become unbreathable and that don't provide a no very Nobel uh, Prize winners. I'm infinitely grateful to the University of Geneva for having trained me for having specialized myself in what I'm forced to call my academic uh, eclecticism, uh, if you forgive this oxymoron. The, this university offered me what I had, uh, what it has the best, uh, the joy of the diversity of knowledge. And I wish you, dear students, uh, to take advantage of this in turn without moderation. Thank you for your attention. Corinne, Corinne, tu vas être obligée de revenir. Corinne, s'il te plaît, il y a le titre de la Corinne, please uh, return to the stage because we would like to give you your diploma. Alumna 2019. Mesdames et Messieurs. Ladies and gentlemen, to succeed, uh, scientists sometimes need uh, to be stimulated by a competitive spirit, which was uh, the case 25 years ago when uh, Mika, Michel Mayer and uh, Didier Quellos, who were scanning starlight at the same time as another American team looking for the first exoplanet. Uh, and you know who won uh, this competition. They also needed a vision. Uh, they had to show uh, passion for their research. They needed time for this uh, vision to evolve and uh, to come in contact uh, with reality and uh, with uh, the uh, critical look of other scientists. And in this way, they were able uh, to push back the boundaries of what we can collectively achieve. Today, the challenges uh, we face uh, seem even more daunting because maybe they are less uh, technological than deeply human. They mobilize our most unique resources, uh, the unique talents that each of us has acquired through our personal, educational, intellectual, and professional paths. How will we adapt uh, to an increasingly hot planet, increasing migration flows, and the resulting human rights abuses? How will we cope with the digital transition? How will we address the ethical issues uh, related to artificial intelligence and genetic development? These challenges uh, address our intelligence, ladies and gentlemen, our affect and the idea we have of our place in society. It is with this background, with these constraints, but also with this wealth, resulting in particular from diversity, that we must look to the future. Numerous uh, university studies, uh, particularly within our Faculty of Psychology and Educational Sciences, have shown that diversity in all its dimensions has a positive impact on the dynamics and performance of a group, on its ability to collectively solve uh, complex problems. Whether in private companies, uh, research teams, or in the training sector, individuals are more creative and motivated when they meet uh, people of another gender or origin. In other words, diversity makes us a collectively more intelligent. We give the best of ourselves when we have to revise or revisit our certainties, when we pay attention to opinions or hypotheses that appear at first, first glance to be dissonant or even unintelligible, when we do not uh, you know, disdain uh, to consider incongruous, disruptive, or marginal opinions. Uh, film maker Jean-Luc Godard had once made this remark to a journalist who asked him if he was not feeling a little marginal. Yes, he replied, but in a book, it is the margins that hold the pages together. So let us have the courage to explore the margins in virgin spaces, because there are still some to explore. Let us have the audacity to talk to each other, to share our ideas, especially when we have not grown up in the same schools and attended the same circles. 
It is on the strength of our diversity that we will be able to find solutions to crises uh, that threaten to take us into an irreversible phase of turbulence and regression. This truth has a particular residence, resonance rather, in the academic world. For too long, universities have tolerated the underrepresentation of women in the faculty and the disadvantages uh, they face on uh, research teams. Moreover, even if globalization has been thought of in universities, uh, the composition of the teaching staff of Western schools of higher education is often only a pale reflection of the cultural and linguistic diversity that can be found, for instance, in the streets of Geneva. Ladies and gentlemen, I had the opportunity uh, before on this day of the Dias Academicus uh, to tell you about the university of which I dream today. I would like to strongly express my commitment to an inclusive university, a university that knows how to turn its diversity into an asset, a university where everybody finds their place, the means to flourish and to be heard. Far from thinking of erecting walls and barbed wire and the foolish hope of protecting us, we are helping to train here in Geneva the thousands of young people of very diverse backgrounds who each year reach the threshold of higher education and who hold the keys to our future. We provide them with the tools to understand the complexity of international issues and provide thoughtful responses. We have developed uh, instruments uh, such as the promotion of acquired experience in order to widen access to higher education to people with atypical backgrounds or from disadvantaged backgrounds. With the support of our authorities, uh, who have been pioneers in this field, we have also set up the Academic Horizon Program, which is unique in Switzerland and Europe. Since its creation, it has enabled some 200 refugees uh, uh, living in the canton of Geneva to forge a future for themselves, to integrate into the local community, and to give them in return what they have received from it. Diversity, ladies and gentlemen, is also transdisciplinarity, a combination of approaches uh, uh, to create the, the future health professionals, uh, placing people who are learning in uh, realistic intervention situations where they're required to combine the different roles, practices, and cultures of medicine and nursing care. The Interprofessional Simulation Center to which we are awarding the Innovation Medal this year is a very good example of these new pedagogical approaches. To prevent the, the erosion of democratic principles, uh, we're nurturing uh, Switzerland's extraordinary experience in diversity management through our social science research, uh, while strengthening our rule of law and the respect for minorities and mobilizing our students uh, on the rights of the most vulnerable people in our society. This is uh, the remarkable work done in recent years under the aegis of the Law Clinic, which has made it possible to address issues uh, such as the rights of LGBT persons, uh, women without uh, legal status, or Roma of uh, Romanian uh, uh, origin in precarious situation in Geneva, to foster dialogue between the different religious currents and adapt uh, our teaching to a pluralistic uh, world, the Faculty of Theology, uh, set up this autumn courses uh, for the study of uh, spirit, uh, spiritualities and interreligious studies uh, by giving its students uh, the means to think about the relationship between Christianity and the other major religious traditions. The diversity of a uh, school of higher education, uh, Ms. Chapinier, you recall this earlier, is also measured by the versatility of its uh, teaching and research fields. We are now reaping the benefits of this to meet the challenges of our society which can only find real solutions in interdisciplinarity, the one that only the versatility of a university like ours can offer to its students and society at large, an asset uh, that we want to keep against all odds. For example, a university center of expertise has been created around the issue of freshwater resources, including the Geneva Water Hub, Grid Geneva, and the platform for international freshwater law, geographers and geophysicists, uh, diplomats, lawyers, economists, and engineers are working together 
to develop a solutions uh, to prevent a conflict uh, over water. This is work done together with uh, the Confederation and international organizations. So these examples, uh, ladies and gentlemen, show the, the choice made over many years uh, to promote research and teaching at the intersection of strong disciplines has been a winning option for our university, one that allows us uh, to play a central role in many societal issues. It is this asset uh, that allows us uh, to develop an ambitious uh, digital strategy driven by the richness of all the disciplines uh, that must be brought together to meet the challenges of facing our society, to create also the trust uh, that is lacking today within the population and that generates a resistance uh, to technical innovation. You will have understood uh, uh, that uh, the idea that I have of a university which is inclusive uh, is a place where all disciplines are important because all produce richness. To build a more inclusive university, we also need to forge uh, solid partnerships based on well-considered expectations with other academic institutions. And I would like to pay tribute to the presence of many rectors uh, and uh, presidents of schools of higher education in Switzerland. And uh, this is something that we have done in collaboration with the uh, universities on the African continent, uh, which will certainly have a major geopolitical, economic, and cultural impact uh, in the coming decades. Through these partnerships, uh, we aim to promote exchanges between students and researchers who have followed very different paths around common themes. In this way, we want to contribute to maintaining a multilateral vision of global issues. I am convinced uh, that in a world engulfed in withdrawal policies, uh, universities have a fundamental card to play in strengthening academic uh, multilateralism and scientific diplomacy. And it is in this spirit uh, that we have developed uh, many collaborations with international organizations through the Geneva Science Policy Interface, uh, which provides academic expertise to solve the major challenges facing these organizations. At the European level, we are using our partnerships, uh, particularly with the framework of the European League of Research Universities, LERU, L-E-R-U, to create the foundations for an inclusive Europe, a better bulwark against a rampant populism always based on a sense of exclusion. This is the remarkable work done by Liru, today's recipient of the medal from the University of Geneva. And I'd like to pay tribute uh, to its two representatives uh, who are with us uh, today. Liru has been an extremely important organization to defend Switzerland's place within Europe and is going to continue to work in this vein. We're very grateful to them. An inclusive university is also, and above all, a university that is committed to gender equality and diversity. This commitment uh, concerns all of us, because the idea of gender determines many of our daily behaviors, and because uh, this question tests our real ability to translate into action what we fully understand morally and intellectually. Ladies and gentlemen, the wind has risen, and we can no longer avoid it. In this respect, uh, I believe uh, that we still have a poor idea of how much of the last decade has contributed to the recognition of gender diversity, the new spaces of freedom it has opened up for LGBT people around the world, and the impact that the determination of women has left here in Geneva and Switzerland and at the international level. It is phenomenal this is a step that has been taken. Consider that the conception that has dominated recent centuries, namely that of a world governed essentially by men, preferably white and heterosexual, is gradually becoming anachronistic and appearing for what it is, an indecency and an aberration. At the University of Geneva, this movement has resulted in a campaign against harassment. Uh, the percentage uh, of uh, women today, and this is very pleasing, has reached 47% in 2018, so we're reaching a gender parity, 52% uh, in 2017, although there is a style, still a long way to go, parity is becoming a reality. We have also made a commitment last year by signing the Diversity Charter, a document drawn up by associations and ratified by the Council of State. Um, 
This gives me the opportunity to underline how grateful I am for our collaboration with our cantonal and municipal authorities on these and other issues. And uh, the Nobel Prize that has been awarded to the University of Geneva in this perspective is also your prize, ladies and gentlemen, representing the cantonal and municipal as well as federal authorities. Uh, Thanks sir, to this uh, conversion, uh, university is making its uh, contribution to the development of public policies in align with uh, its role in the 21st century. In the coming years, uh, we will have to show solidarity, certainly a little more modest in our appetite for comfort, but ambitious in relation to our conscience. We are privileged to welcome today among us uh, Ms. Giusy Nicolini, former mayor of Lampedusa and Linoza. I greet her very warmly. At a conference that she gave here some time ago, she told us about her struggle to help migrants uh, from Africa. Her conference uh, showed that solidarity in practice requires hard work, determination, and courage. It is possible to impose economic sanctions on millions of people with one twip Twit move, rather, by tweeting, but nothing, ladies and gentlemen, gives more meaning to the lives of all of us and than the action of Ms. Nicolini and the people of Lampedusa, who have worked to restore a little dignity to thousands of lives left at the mercy of the waves. Ladies and gentlemen, why we live in a climate where our geopolitical, moral, and ideological landmarks are also threatened to turn upside down at every moment we must cling to boys such as those held out to us by these politicians, these men and women, these citizens in Lampedusa and elsewhere, these thousands of scientists who are working to make the facts speak for themselves, these artists who urge us to shift our vision and consider the world from the margins where it sometimes appears to us in all its reality. The sum of these wishes constitutes our wealth of tomorrow. It gives us uh, the signal of optimism, and I'm optimistic, because we can do better for each of the areas uh, I have told you about. That is what I will put all my energy into over the next uh, four years, uh, and the entire university community, uh, I make a commitment in this sense with your support, which is indispensable and precious. Thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I now have the great pleasure of giving uh, the floor to Anne Emerita Center States, Councillor in Charge of the Department of Public Instruction. Monsieur le Rector. Director, members of the Rectorate, representatives of the federal, cantonal, and municipal authorities, the diplomatic and academic authorities, honorary doctors, award winners, members of the teaching staff, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, allow me to begin with, dear rector, to say again how happy the entire community is for Mr. Mayor and Kello's Nobel Prize, a prize that affirms the excellence of our researchers and and solidifies Geneva's place in the international world, a place that we are seeking ever to always uh, strengthen. And we would like to thank you for your work to do so. This confidence is also reflected in the forthcoming ratification of the 2020-2024 objective agreement between the state and the university. This fourth convention links the university's objectives to those of the Canton's various public policies in line with the challenges that face our society. I'm thinking in particular of the digital and ecological transitions, two areas in which the university's teachers and research researchers is essential. Mr. Rector, you said that the banner for this day was diversity. Diversity at our university can be understood in many ways. For example, the decision to maintain a multi-purpose or versatile university, one that is dedicated to both teaching 
and research in many disciplines. Diversity is also reflected in the 14 interfaculty centers that develop the interdisciplinarity necessary to anticipate the future in all its complexity. We also see it in the eyes of the international community of students and researchers who enrich the university and society through their own cultural diversity. At a time of withdrawal into our own identities, at a time when some people believe that walls must once again be built between us, it is more necessary than ever to question what diversity is. As you know, in biology, in biology diversity goes hand in hand with the unity of life. In other words, and to use the title of a beautiful expedition, exhibition at the Musée de l'Homme in Paris, created in cooperation with readers from our university, we are all related, but all also different. There remains a fundamental question. Can we move from biological view to an anthropological view? What we accepted in biological terms can we also accept for human societies? The difficulty there is to combine the unity of human beings and their diversity. How do we achieve a peaceful community where we live together while also recognizing and valuing the plurality of cultures. To paraphrase the United States Declaration of Independence, we take these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. But we must not also forget that the equality of human beings and the universality of their rights has come late to history. History has taught us that cultural differences have been and still are the source of many conflicts in a permanent logic of exclusion, rejection of difference, and remaining confined to false certainties. To give you just one example, remember the success after the attacks of September 11th, Samuel Huntington's theory on the clash of civilizations. For him, the end of the Cold War marked the collapse of ideologies, in particular communism. This collapse was to go along with a revival of cultural and religious identities on a global scale. The thesis of the clash of civilization contradicts the idea of a single humanity that is brought together by universal va values shared by all. I believe, on the contrary, that we must go guard against such pessimism, which is more a matter of ideology than a rigorous analysis of the facts. After all, as Claude Lévi-Strauss wrote in Race and History, the barbarian is the one who believes in barbarity. In fact, today we live in a globalized world a world where there are constant interactions and where cultural diversity is a reality. It is up to all of us to make this diversity a source of strength and of richness. However, this is only possible when three conditions are met. The first is to le leave no one by the side of the road. How can we agree to open markets and the free movement of people if this is understood by some people to be the cause of their difficulties in finding a job and meeting ends meet. The second is not to fall into the trap of communitarianism or assimilation. Cultural diversity is neither cohabitation nor denying simple differences. It is, after all, a question of being a bit like Switzerland, a common identity built on the acceptance of the multiplicity of specific cultural identities. This brings me to the third condition. Before we can accept another person, you must first be able to accept yourself. We must know and understand the values that shape our own identity, know and understand our own history. Tolerance cannot take root in ignorance. This gives, brings us to the importance of access to knowledge and into the places that provide knowledge. I'm thinking obviously of school, but also universities. The university is at the heart of the city. It plays a civic role in helping us understand the complexity of the world and in resisting the simplistic and reductive discourses that feed populism with knowledge. I would like to thank you, Mr. Rector, as well as the Rector's Office and the entire university community for this. And I wish you all a beautiful and enriching university year. Thank you. Students in Geneva are fortunate to have 
the international community within their university. Studying abroad, studying in another country, or even internationally, is also an incredible advantage that allows us to develop cross-cutting skills and to forge our networks, but also to strengthen our self-confidence and improve our chances for finding a job. University mobility is precious, and we hope to see it done in both directions, both in and out of Switzerland. So, and I thank the mobility services within the university for all the work that they do throughout the year. Today we wanted to share a video clip with you, our university's visiting card, which, as you will see, is a bit original. Welcome to Geneva. Hey, Sandy. Yes, Bobby. Tell me, where are you going to study next semester? Geneva, should I introduce it to you? Yes, please. Welcome to Switzerland. To a unique place to study in Europe. The University of Geneva. An institution devoted to excellence. In the heart of the world's densest international ecosystem. That's cool. The city of the United Nations. Very cool. The International Red Cross. Super cool. The World Health Organization. Mega cool. The International Labor Office. Top top cool. The World Trade Organization. Over cool. But are you going to mention all? My friend Google says that there are more than 750 organizations there. Okay, but let's still mention CERN. Oh yeah baby, that's where the web was invented and Higgs boson discovered. I'm able to communicate with you thanks to them. Calm down Bobby. So, Geneva, in the heart of an urban campus, close to nature, the mountains, adventure. Sandy, does it have something to do with global warming? Yes, but that's another matter. The film was shot in July. Come on Bobby. Okay. A renowned, human-sized university. To build your academic and professional network. And social life. I dream of having friends, real one. A city where you'll walk in the steps of inspiring personalities. From the past and the present. Who's that guy? The one who discovered the first extrasolar planet and who just won a Nobel Prize with that guy. And these one won the Fields Medal. Not bad. A city to perfect your French, while still having the possibility to speak English. Uh, je voudrais le fondue à la fromage. Pardon? A fondue? Uh, le fromage? Oh, the cheese fondue, typical Swiss dish. Yeah. Lots of melted cheese, delicious. <laughs> and you dip the bread and you mustn't drop it oh. in. Mm, we don't do that here. It's a vegan restaurant. Melted cheese? Were those guys serious? A university where you can attend lessons in two different faculties at the same time. Are you sure humans can do that? Not at the same time, but in the same semester. Ah, 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 okay, got it. At the University of Geneva, you're in a good university. Some say one of the best. At the University of Geneva, you'll prepare for your future. You'll get to meet the world. You are the world. Welcome. Hey Sandy, do you think I can join too? Hey Bobby. Yes Sandy. What are you doing tonight? Nothing. Except a stupid backup. We could have a cheese fondue together. And then go to the lake. Great Bobby, you're a nice person. Van Dishoek. Dear Owen Van Dishoek, please join me on the stage. You said that a person from the Netherlands is inevitably linked to water. In fact, in your beautiful country, water is everywhere, held back by the dikes, guided into canals, and falling from the clouds. 
It's not surprising then that you one day wanted to know where this omnipresent liquid came from. To find an answer, you looked towards the clouds, not the clouds across the Dutch sky, but much further clou clouds much further away that float between the stars. You are a molecular astrophysics professor at the University of Leiden. You teach and have been doing research for near 30, nearly 30 years in this institution after a brilliant career that took you to the universities of Harvard, Princeton, and Caltech in the United States. Today, you dedicate your work to interstellar clouds and protoplanetary disks. You use innovation to combine the worlds of chemistry, physics, and astronomy to study the makeup, the evolution, and the chemical processes that take place in them and which are the basis of the formation of the primordial constituents of the planetary systems. As you cannot study these objects with binoculars, you have been involved in planning new uh, uh, astronomical or observatories, such as the Heschel Space Telescope, the, the ALMA Radio Telescope in Chile, and the future James Webb Space Telescope, the long-awaited successor to the Hubble. The best instruments needed to analyze these clouds, which are particularly sparse and less dense than the best void that can be obtained in the laboratory. They are vast, however, and in addition to dust, they are made up, in addition to the surprisingly high number of chemical compounds, water in the form of gas and ice. Your work has helped, to the, has helped further the understanding of where the water that flows through the canals of the Netherlands comes from, the water that crashes on the beaches of the Nordvoik near Leiden, a beach that you have been to since your childhood. In short, all the water on the earth and even in the comets that make occasional visits to our solar system. It comes from the original cloud. Water formed in its mist. It covered the dust grains with ice, making them stick together and encouraging them to stick together into larger and larger grains, then pieces, then blocks, planetoids, and then finally into planets. As you say, history repeats itself a bit everywhere around the galaxy. Watery worlds like the Earth may not be as rare as we think, after all. Ewen van der Soek, you are not only a high-achieving scientist, you are also particularly active in passing on your passion to your colleagues through by educating, by education and by scientific con communication. You were the scientific director of NOVA, the Netherlands School for Astronomy, and in 2018, you also took over the presidency of the International Astronomical Unity, Union, which is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. Your work has been awarded, rewarded with numerous prizes, such as the Spinoza Prize in 2000, the Albert Einstein World Award of Science in 2015, and the Kavli Prize for Astrophysics last year, one of the most important uh, awards in the discipline to thank you for allowing us to dream as we look at the stars, to, for helping us to understand where we come from, and spe especially for all of the scientific prowess that you have carried out. The University of Geneva is proud to give to you the title of an honorary doctorate. Chère Florence Dupont, je vous prie de bien vouloir me rejoindre. Dear Florence Dupont, please join me on stage. Greek and Roman antiquity is often presented as the cradle of civilization. 
where all the values of modern Europe, such as rationality, democracy, law, and even theater, find their origins. The least we can say, Florence Dupont, is that you do not share this point of view. You explain that Greek theater has, is not at all like today's theater, that Greek democracy has only a very few points in common with ours, that in the past we, there was no difference, distinction between astrology and astronomy, and that the distinction between rational thought and religious thought is a modern dichotomy that has no basis in, in antiquity. Nothing bothers you quite as much of the projection of modern concepts onto antiquity. For you, Greeks and Romans are savages just like anyone else. And there is no reason for us to s see them as closer to current European Europeans than to Lebanese or Syrians or Egyptians. You break with this artificial continuity between the antique and the modern worlds. This conviction comes from your research. You are, of course, a Hellenist and a Latinist. You say that you are an antiquitarian. Born in Bayeux, you studied classics at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris. You defended your thesis in Latin at the University of Paris before teaching at University of Nice and Nancy, then Paris, all while working with the Centre Gernet, which is dedicated to comparative research on ancient societies. In your first book in 1977, The Pleasure and the Law, you talked about the Greek banquet, which was under the patronage of Dionysus, and said that it cannot be related to the modern theories of sexual liberation. You were also interested in the theater, and in particular, Seneca's tragedy, which you translated. This has helped you understand that at the time, at the time, plays were part of a broader religious ritual and that the text was simply added on to previously designed staging, the opposite of what happens today. Your work has given rise to numerous productions, the latest of which is The Est by Thomas Choley, who was opened at the Avignon Festival in 2018. Your translation showed the absolute cruelty of the text, if we are to believe the frightened but nevertheless admiring reaction of the critics. Your bibliography also includes works with evocative titles, Aristotle or the Vampire of the Western Theater, Rome, a city with no origin, Antiquity, Territory of Gaps, and even Homer and Dallas. Uh, and I'm just speaking about the television show, Dallas. Your interest for television series uh, was revealed in 2007 in an op-ed in the Monde Diplomatique where you uh, studied the series Rome. You explained that almost everything in it is false. In fact, this series, all like, like all the peplums that use the material for your s research, are only used to comfort us in the fictitious origin and the imperialist ideology of the West and comfort us in our faith in its proper, its own moral evolution. By giving you the title of the Dr. Honoris Causes, the University of Geneva hopes to welcome your invaluable contribution to the science of antiquity, which allows us to take a different look at the contemporary world. Dear Patricia Schultz, please join, join me on the stage. The full development of a country, the well-being of the world, and the cause of peace require the fullest participation of women, their equality with men in all domains. This quotation from the preamble to the convention, International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women certainly expresses, dear Ms. Schultz, the deep conviction that has guided you throughout your career. 
your passionate commitment, your determination, and the constant availability of your skills in the service of women's rights, women from any origin, there's any sexual orientation or any age, have led you to become an emblematic figure in the fight for to achieve real equality between men and women. You were also the first Swiss woman to sit on the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against, against Women as an independent expert. It, and you, this you did for two consecutive terms from 2011 to 2018. You are very independently minded. You have always been so, particularly in the 16 years during which you worked at the heart of the federal administration as director of the Federal Office for Equality. In this context, you led the Swiss delegation to the Fourth World Conference on Women in 1995. This was the, an occasion to reaffirm the principle of the University of Women's Rights as human rights, an integral part of you, those human rights. When you returned to Switzerland, you ensured their, the implementation of the Beijing Conference Platform for Action. In Switzerland, you played a decisive role in carry, creating tools to identify gender-based salary inequalities, a tool which was developed in cooperation with the University of Geneva. Throughout your career, you have been able to combine your commitment in the field and academic research work. A graduate of the University of Geneva and later a teaching assistant and a lecturer at the law school, you titled one of your first scientific articles, Effects and Lack of Effects of the Constitutional Article on Equality. That set the tone. Since then, you have published numerous reference text in your field of expertise, and you are regularly invited to give classes in law schools, particularly at the University of Geneva, with which you have maintained very close ties. At the UN, you have helped draft several general recommendations, which are of fundamental importance, including the recommendations on women's access to justice and on violence against women, you continue, you are continuing your work currently as an associate researcher at the United Nations Institute, Institute for Development Research. Dear Patricia Schultz, the University of Geneva is pleased to honor you and to award you with this honorary doctorate as we are celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Henri. Dear Henri Jacobi, please join me on stage. Henri Jacobi, in 1990, when you read the first report of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, you quickly realized that climate change would become a difficult and frustrating subject. You also understood that the subject is so important that you would have to devote your entire career to it. And on both of these points, you have been entirely correct. At the time of the publication of the report, you were already a professor of management at MIT. 
You were putting into place the MIT Joint Program on the Science and Policy of Global Change. The originality of this program lies in the inclusion of natural and social sciences in a process to analyze the political measures put in place in the face of the threat of climate change. Including them both is the only approach, in your opinion, that will be able to make a substantial contribution to this discipline in an academic context. This joint program, which you continue to lead and which you continues to carry out research on analysis of climate issues, was under your co-leadership for 20 years. It is in this context that, you're crossed, that your path crossed that of the University of Geneva. In 2001, the Swiss Pole or Center for Climate Research dedicated to climate research was founded. One of the first postdoc students recruited by our group in Geneva came, was just coming back from a stint in your program. This is how the contact was established and the beginning of a close cooperation between our two institutions. You often regularly invite uh, Geneva researchers to the MIT Forum on Global Change, thereby giving them the opportunity to take the temperature of climate policy, um, governments, and of businesses. Thanks to this, the University of Geneva has seen the birth of a long line of young researchers who are inspired by your work and who develop their own integrated models. As for your own journey, it began in Texas. And it was not immediately uh, one that was concerned with in the environment. When you entered the University of Texas at Austin, you decided to study oil and gas engineering. However, a summer spent under in the oil fields in the stultifying Texas heat convinced you to take a different path, and the following year you began studying mechanical engineering. After this first degree, you went to an for another at the University of Harvard to become an economic engineer, a field you were passionate about. It was there that you took part in a development program which, although this is rare, brought together teach professors of economics, engineering, and political science in the same team. The effectiveness of this blend convinced you that including these multiple, multiple disciplines was the right path to take. You dedicated your entire career to it, first at Harvard, then at MIT, with the success that we all know. Dear Henry Jacobi, by awarding you this honorary doctorate, we acknowledge your invaluable contribution to establishing an enlightened and constructive dialogue between academia and the economic and political decision makers on the issue of global change that affects the environment. My message is that we'll be watching you. pense que l'état de droit, ben oui, en fait, c'est une démocratie, c'est voilà, il y a une loi, il y a une règle, on l'applique. 
Non, l'état de droit, c'est plus subtil que ça. Et c'est surtout plus exigeant que ça. La musique que Andreas Vollenweider a composée aide à cette phase de développement du cerveau. Does digital technology offer us fresh hope for the realization of human rights, or is it a game over? L'initiative populaire dont nous parlons ce soir a un excellent titre pour semer le doute. Autodétermination. du combat contre l'antisémitisme, c'est qu'il consiste à tenter d'aider l'antisémite à désupposer. par manque de vigilance, par manque de lucidité, par manque de courage, par manque de volonté, nous laissons faire, nous devenons complices. Cher Guzzi, Dear uh, Giuse Nicolini, in 2012, you were elected mayor of Lampedusa, a small Italian island of 20 kilometers, square kilometers, and less than 6,000 inhabitants. Lampedusa is located in the middle of the Mediterranean, closer to the African coast than to Sicily. Your job was probably the least uh, enviable in Italy because you found yourself in the front line of the Mediterranean migration crisis, which was then in an acute Phase. In October 2013, the Mediterranean was hit by one of the world's worst maritime disasters, and it was uh, to Lampedusa that the bodies were brought back day after day. In an interview that you gave, you said this procession of corpses has left a smell of death in the air for more than a month. It's a sometime, something that forces you to get on the side of life, and it is resolutely for life and dignity, and against inhumanity and shame that you stand up. And you did this with energy, with conviction, and with all your heart, which is why you were nicknamed uh, Lampedusa Lioness. You witnessed uh, during your a uh, five-year term in office of the arrival on your island of tens of thousands of migrants and repeated shipwrecks off your coast, you tried to mobilize the Italian and European authorities to find real solutions. For you, the heart of Europe uh, that the Mediterranean represents must not be ignored, militarized, or, above all, transformed into a cemetery. The most urgent thing you point out very often is to reform the right of asylum and open humanitarian corridors. In a speech that contrasts with the increasingly populous positions in vogue on the continent, you call on Europeans to see in each refugee not a future immigrant, but a human being who was going to drown and who was saved, because it was our duty. Your commitment to the cause of migrants has earned you international recognition with the Simone de Beauvoir Prize awarded uh, in 2016 and the UNESCO Houfouet Boigny Peace Prize in 2017. For all this, 
and because you have done everything in your power to ensure that the tragedy of migrants remains an unbearable thing and does not become a habit or a weariness, the University of Geneva is honored by your presence today and proud to give you the floor. Madame Nicolini. Thank you, Dean, for having given me the chance to uh, come back here to Geneva. I must say that I was here two years ago, but I really I didn't remember that I, uh, I felt such uh, an excitement. I really moved. I'm only uh, in the presence of a Nobel Prize here. When I... Uh, thought uh, of coming here, I thought I would have come and tell about my experience as a woman mayor to talk about what the effects of gender might be on an island which is considered to be a gateway to Europe, but also as uh, some outskirts of Europe for people who live there. But then something happened, a terrible event made me change my mind. In the night between the 6th and the 7th of October, a boat sunk close to my island. And this is something that keeps on happening. And that happened right in front of two army rescue boats that arrived too late to save the people. And this is the same story that happened in during many other shipwrecks. The engine had stopped, the sea was rough, the people uh, set some clothes on fire to draw the attention of uh, rescuers in the dark of night, and uh, people got nervous, they moved to one side, and the uh, boat capsized. Uh, 22 people were saved, but at least 30 died. 13 bodies have been retrieved, uh, these are all uh, young sub-Saharan women. There was also a 12-year-old uh, child. We're still searching for uh, 17 missing uh, bodies. Uh, people who survived uh, said that there, were, was only, there was also a uh, new uh, uh, a baby of eight uh, months and a two-year-old and two 12-year-olds. Uh, this uh, little girl was seen by Wisson, a 19-year-old uh, boy who tried to uh, save her, grabbed her, but then he was uh, pulled down by another man who was uh, trying to save himself. He had to get rid of his trousers to get back to the surface, and this is how he uh, lost the little girl. Before my trip here to Geneva, I went to the funerals which were organized by the local church. Nor the national or uh, local authorities were present at the funeral. Even after the end of, the, uh, of Salvini's Ministry of Fear, that's how I call it, and the creation of a new government, I must say that the uh, political climate in my country apparently is not yet inclined to uh, revoke the so-called uh, decrees on uh, safety made by Salvini that uh, eliminated protect humanitarian protection and reduced protection to uh, asylum seekers, destroying the uh, reception system integration and promoting the criminalization of the rescue operations at sea. It doesn't even seem the good time to show some pity uh, towards these uh, new uh, dead that we should have and could have saved to honor the victims of shipwrecks when the sea gives us back their bodies means to recognize their human dignity. It means welcoming them into our communities, even by placing a nameless tombstones on their tombs. And then we need to denounce the injustice of these deaths and to pledge to fight against this kind of injustice. 
But times have changed quickly since the 3rd of October 2013, uh, the time of that uh, tremendous uh, shipwreck. If victims are not at least 368, like the ones that died in that shipwreck. Politicians don't go to honor the dead, but they don't even feel the need to say anything. This is a silence that I find horrendous and scary, because it makes me think back to the feeling that I had when I was in Lampedusa in 2013, before the Pope came, and it makes me think uh, about the, uh, the horror that the world felt after the uh, shipwreck of the 3rd of October. This silence shows not only that our politics are obsolete, but it also shows a lack of awareness and of humanity. Standing in front of those 13 numbered coffins, uh, maybe this is not enough for politicians, but I decided that I wanted to speak about them, about these women who were not treated equally even in their deaths, who suffered during their uh, journey in, their, uh, in the camps where uh, uh, we, single women are systematically raped and then they're deprived of their own identity. I want to talk about them because silence is indifferent and indifference are fought with words. I think that the fight against all forms of discrimination and inequality is a, a absolute priority of our time together with the climate change and uh, uh, the, uh, the environment and nature. These are all issues that are intertwined. I also think that we need to feel the urge to do something for some human beings that are considered to be so different that they are rejected at all costs. They're considered as useless, they're considered to be a liability and so dangerous that they, uh, there needs to be a huge effort to reduce these migratory flaws building walls and all kinds of barriers and where and if that's not possible such as on the uh, frontier of the Mediterranean Sea these uh, policies of reform and cause horrible effects death and suffering not only violation of human rights shipwrecks have been given the task to act not only as a deterrent, but actually as a regulating factor, regulating the fluxes and the flaws. A shipwreck cannot be considered an inevitable disaster. But today, responsibility for these deaths is not only Europe's that I uh, accused up to 2013 and the following years. Today, people who are responsible are also the ones who are sent away, all the uh, NGOs who were doing uh, rescue operations in the Mediterranean Sea. Some people say that if you uh, talk to the individual migrant, as I do, as people from Lampedusa do, and all the islands like Lampedusa in the Mediterranean, the only thing that you can do is be moved because of the uh, story of these people, because of the suffering and pain and hope that they pass on. But decision makers say that they have to look at the big picture and not at individuals in order to uh, plan for the future. Even if this were true, and I can tell you that I've seen many people that were saved in Lampedusa when I was an activist, but also when I was a mayor. And I can assure you, I always took a look at the big picture. 
only uh, since uh, 2015, that, uh, since, that's since the end of the Mare Nostrum, the first humanitarian operation in the Mediterranean that only lasted one year because it was uh, accused of saving too many lives, of having uh, and saying that the uh, action of the NGOs would only increase the arrivals. There was a war uh, waged against the NGOs that were, were defined as uh, taxis of the sea and uh, accomplices of uh, the traffickers. Since 2015, 15,000 people have died. These are numbers that uh, seem the ones uh, in, uh, of a war. And the future seems to be uh, an endless slaughter because this has been going on for uh, so many years. And the stories of each migrant helps us to understand that who uh, jumps on those boats has already taken death into the account. Unlike the trafficking, uh, drugs trafficking or uh, arms trafficking that does not make a profit without uh, the goods being delivered, human trafficking is done with uh, uh, the payment at the beginning of the journey. Uh, criminal organizations can maybe uh, change uh, their routes according to different policies adopted by countries, like it happened in 2018 when the route towards Spain was uh, open and it's at the first place with the 60, 64,000 arrivals against the 23,000 in Italy. But when, but if uh, humans do not reach their destination, traffickers don't lose any money. And therefore, I don't understand why there should be a collaboration between traffickers and NGOs. And this is also shown by the fact that the uh, judicial inquiries have been dismissed and didn't bring to anything, unlike the political actions that produces, produced the infamous abandonment at the sea for, for days of fragile, vulnerable people. Despite this war against NGOs, arrivals have never stopped. And the decrease is not due to the rescue operations that are not there anymore. Of the 4,500 uh, 4, people arrived in Italy, since in 2019, only 239 were rescued by NGOs. Uh, the uh, ports then were only closed uh, to uh, uh, the Mediterranean, the, to open arms uh, and the other NGO boats, but not to boats that used to, uh, that managed to arrive to Lampedusa on their own, particularly from Tunisia. Uh, the same day in which the courageous uh, captain Rakete decided to enter the port of Lampedusa when she, and then she was arrested as a criminal, 70 people had arrived uh, uh, on their own. The uh, decrease of the arrivals in Italy actually might be due to the uh, agreement that Italy signed with Libya in 2017. The uh, agreement reduced the arrivals because it gave the task uh, to coordinate the rescue operations to the uh, Libyan Coastal Guard along a, a huge SAR area with terrible consequences, violence, uh, anomalies during rescue operations, reformants in Libya, people were sent back to the criminals they were trying to escape from. In the last few days, the uh, Italian Catholic newspaper, the Avenire, showed some pictures that uh, proved the participation of a human trafficker, the criminal Bija from Libya. Uh, he participated to the institutional summit in Sicily 
in May 2017 that brought to the agreement between Italy and Libya. This man was already known by the UN and other organizations as a head of an armed militia dealing with human trafficking. And this confirmed that the uh, Libyan Coastal Guard is partly criminal, as a criminal organization, and that wants to, and that uh, this agreement will bring a lot of money to this organization. Sending away NGOs uh, from the Mediterranean uh, and accusing them of collaborating with these criminals is within the uh, framework of uh, uh, not having any witness to these activities, something that goes against the Geneva Convention and the international uh, law for rescue. And then the experience of mourning and uh, suffering, the stories that were told by the people who arrived uh, to my islands, not only moved me, but they also disturbed me. They left some permanent marks inside of me, like the a, a child that I saw when I was a, a mayor who, uh, they, uh, to whom they skinned his legs up to the uh, knee, or uh, a, um, a little uh, girl from Sudan, uh, her uh, four-year-old son died and she took a picture of his dead body because he never had a picture of his son alive or uh, the story of a friend who kept telling me in an obsessive way that she had managed to save herself by grabbing another dead body. I was devastated by the view of uh, young people that died inside the boat of uh, asphyxia. They didn't have any nails uh, as they uh, fought to get some air discovering a woman that died while giving birth and that was uh, fished inside, uh, from inside the boat that sunk on the 3rd of October. We found her with her fetus uh, still attached to her and that showed me that there's no limit to horror. And when I tell these stories, I don't want to move you. I think that approaching in a different way this uh, emergency is possible. Not if we cry and then we forget, but only if we are able to see these people as people who have rights, rights that were violated in their homeland, during their journey, in the camps in Libya, and even here in our sea. Only then will we be able to give political answers and not just feeling moved. Only then we'll be able to give a political answer. Overcoming this challenge, which we know it's tough, it's difficult, tiring. We know this very well in Lampedusa because since 2013, we were the only place uh, where people arrived in Europe. But as uh, we know this, I can tell you that this effort, this huge effort, is nothing compared to the determination some people have to let these people drown, to uh, reject those who are lucky enough to arrive alive, uh, who are foster exploitation, uh, irregular work, segregation, exclusion, even towards small little children who uh, are denied food in school or access to social services. This brings degradation, fear, and uh, insecurity, and fosters hate, racism, 
and xenophobia. Putting an end to this tragedy must represent an absolute priority, not only for Lampedusa or for the women of Lampedusa, such as me, but for all us Europeans. Europe, which was uh, created to prevent the repeating of the horrors of the great wars and to overcome those inhumane times, violence and the abuse between men to avoid uh, persecution of the other, the Jew, uh, the homosexual, up to their annihilation, Europe created a universal protection system of fundamental rights. The European, uh, these are rights that belong to all countries. And these European countries wrote constitutions that uh, make uh, peace, cooperation and solidarity as funding values of their democracies. And today I ask you to become witness of these values, to protect and reinforce Europe of rights against the Europe of sovereignism that we have already wit witnessed. And we need to keep in mind that nothing is granted forever, not even for us. Thank you.
cher Paul. Dear Paula Merlo, you representing Christina Gulodava, who could not come to Geneva, please join me on stage. The originality of your work, Christina Gulodava, is a combination of various disciplines that don't dialogue with each other very often. Its research is the subject of a combination of mathematics, IT, and language sciences. And thanks to these formulas and models, Christine Gulodova has analyzed the syntactic structure, world order, sentence generation. Her field is called computer linguistics, and it allows her to combine two of her passions, digits and letters. Digits, uh, Christina Gulodava, she knows them well. She's a Russian national, obtained her bachelor's degree in applied mathematics and computer science at the State Polytechnic University of St. Petersburg in Russia. This uh, school of higher studies has a long reputation uh, for excellence in exact sciences. And when she arrived at the University of Geneva, her entourage understood very quickly that uh, she would not make that reputation lie and confirm all of her mathematical talent. Uh, letters and languages. Uh, she has a passion for languages. Uh, and she studied uh, Russian, English, French, and Italian, and perhaps also Spanish and, and Catalan, uh, since uh, today she works uh, in Barcelona. And uh, she is uh, developing a neuronal networks uh, today. This is very important uh, to learn uh, the beginnings of language acquisition. But her real fascination are the rules uh, that idioms follow. This uh, fascination leads her, after a master's degree in computer science and machine learning at the University of Italian Speaking Switzerland uh, in Lugano, uh, to further study this uh, topic. Uh, and the intriguing, intriguing rules uh, that uh, idioms uh, follow. And uh, she joined Paolo Mello as professor in the Department of Linguistics at the Faculty of Arts. Uh, and her thesis called World Order, Variation and Dependency, Length Minimization, a Cross-Linguistic Computational Approach. This is an IT and multilingual approach uh, to two linguistic uh, problems. The first, the variation in word order, that is well known. The second, the minimization of the length of depth Dependencies is less known. Her thesis uh, made an important contribution to a better understanding of the rule that words uh, that are related to each other tend to come closer together within the same sentence. Uh, in her research, uh, uh, Christina Gulodova developed a model uh, that made it possible to simulate uh, this minimization of the length of dependencies, a model inspired by the architecture of neural networks uh, and uh, emphasized uh, the importance of automatic uh, learning, machine learning. The thesis uh, had scientific implications, particularly in linguistics and the study of language evolution. But it was also a very important uh, field of man-machine interface, uh, since it gave very valuable tools uh, to the automatic generation of sentences whose form and sequence of words seems very natural for this achievement. And to reward her original thinking and bold ideas uh, that have uh, seduced uh, her thesis director and jury members, we're very mm, pleased to present through you, to present her with the Latsis Prize. Dear Alois Fürstner, please join me on stage. Alois, Alois Fürstner, some would be tempted to call you the Mozart of catalysis. It is, of course, a reference to your Austrian origin, but also a reference to the talent with which you have worked to develop and understand certain forms of this process, which is essential to modern chemistry and make it possible to optimize chemical reactions. In concrete terms, 
your work is root in the field of homogeneous uh, catalysis and organometallic chemistry, a discipline in which you are a pioneer on, and of which you're one of the first to grasp the enormous potential for the synthesis of uh, complex natural products uh, of biological interest. Particularly creative and prolific, you have contributed uh, to achievements uh, whose uh, titles may not speak to the layman, but which are important milestones for chemists, uh, including the metathesis of alkenes and alkynes, uh, the development of platinum-based uh, carbophilic uh, catalysts, and so on and so forth. You are also considered uh, to be a uh, green chemist, and this is very important. The catalysts that you develop are so effective that you're able to carry out particularly clean uh, chemical reactions, uh, namely those that produce only a very small amount of waste. These achievements have earned you an international reputation and a long list of awards from research institutions around the world. Not only have you been a world leader in your field for years, you have also succeeded in maintaining a pleasant atmosphere in your laboratory, a productive and pleasant atmosphere. Everyone who's been there can attest to that. This remarkable journey began in Austria, where you were born in 1962. You studied chemistry at the Technical University of Graz and obtained your PhD in 1987. A note with the episode in 1990 and 1991, you were a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Geneva under the aegis of Wolfgang von Oppolzer, a professor of chemistry who is now deceased as a Former department alumni will recall that Pulso was a colorful character, a brilliant and noisy scientist uh, who left his mark on the history of chemistry in Geneva and beyond. The uh, bubbling chemist helped to forge your mind. This is something that you uh, recognize. And the visit to his lab it was uh, a very positive uh, experience. In the group of uh, Wolfgang Oppolza, you was able to work with Chantal, your future wife, um, who was also working on her PhD thesis. After Geneva, you returned uh, to Graz in Austria, where you obtained your habilitation in organic chemistry in 1992. And then you joined the Max Planck Institute for Kohlenforschung, an institute to which uh, you remained faithful throughout your career. You started as a group leader before being promoted to the rank of director in 1998. Uh, for all your work and your invaluable contribution to the advancement of chemistry, the University of Geneva is more than happy to award you the 2019 Nessim Habif World Prize, which is presented to you by the rector of the university, Mr. Yves Flukiger. I ask uh, Elizabeth Van Gessel, founder and former director, and Patricia Picciottino, current uh, deputy director of the Interprofessional Simulation Center, to join me on stage. Dear Elizabeth and dear Patricia, this won't be news to you. Training health professionals is a constant challenge, uh, as the professions concerned are constantly evolving. Care situations are becoming more and more complex. Health uh, professions, once very compartmentalized, uh, must uh, collaborate more and more intensely. And last but not least, uh, the patient must also be integrated into the care process as a full partner. One response to these needs was the creation in 2013 of the Interprofessional Simulation Center. At the time, it was a bold gamble. Uh, the idea was to share between the university's faculty of medicine and the Haute École de Santé of HESSO Geneva the training of students and health professionals in uh, technical uh, gestures and interprofessional approaches. Uh, this audacity paid off. Barely four years later, seduced and convinced, uh, the University Hospitals of Geneva and the Geneva Home Support Institution joined the project, uh, making their own skills available. 
As a result, 2000 uh, university and HESSO students and as many health professionals and postgraduate continuing education benefit uh, from uh, the expertise of the center. Why the success? First, because uh, the center is interprofessional. Nowadays, uh, treating the same patient often requires the skills of many specialists. It's in everyone's interest that these professionals share the same vocabulary and common understanding. To illustrate the importance of this uh, point, a 1999 report by the American Institute of Medicine stated that medical errors uh, killed more people than road accidents. And according to the authors, in half the cases, uh, the fault lay in the lack of communication within uh, the medical health team. It is precisely the center's mission to remedy this, uh, characterized by a very high degree of decompartmentalization. It allows physicians, midwives, nurses, medical uh, radiology technicians, physiotherapists, dietitians, pharmacists, and other healthcare professionals to work regularly around common issues. This is reflected in three pre-graduate training modules uh, common to the courses of the Haute École de Santé, the School of uh, higher medical studies, and those of the Faculty of Medicine. The CIS is also known for its high tech decor of its premises, and above all, for its models. You have many, but the Victoria Hall, Noel, uh, and their babies in particular, are disturbing in their veracity. Remotely control these hyper-realistic copies of human beings make it possible to simulate as closely as possible to reality the most complex of situations. Uh, we have other pedagogical tools, uh, such as a uh, patient uh, shadowing, an approach uh, that amounts to following individuals and the events of their daily, daily lives, observing them and interacting with them uh, without disrupting the normal course of activities as much as possible. As a result of this uh, uh, project, a CIS was awarded the Interprofessional Prize uh, by the Swiss uh, Academy of Medical Sciences in 2018. Elibet van Gessel, you headed the CIS until your retirement in June of this year. Patricia Picciottino, you succeeded uh, her alongside the current director, Thomas Fassier. The University of Geneva is proud to award you the Medal of Innovation for this outstanding center that fulfills its role so well. Dear Jean Chambard, President of the European League of Research Universities and Court de Catalaya, Secretary General, please join me on stage. Founded in 2002, the European League of Research Univers uh, Universities, LIRU, brings together 23 of the best universities from 12 European countries. This club brings together institutions oriented towards cutting-edge fundamental research and covering a very wide range of academic disciplines. Uh, the University of Geneva is proud uh, uh, to be one of its founding members. LIRU was created to defend academic excellence in Europe. Uh, its objective is to support basic research and promote the idea that it plays an essential role in innovation and the development of society. It therefore aims to help politicians and opinion leaders to better understand how research universities operate and the direct and indirect impacts of their activities on society. To achieve its goals, LIRU sets up working groups to reflect on a multitude of topics ranging from equal opportunities to relations uh, with uh, former students, alumni, the content of European research programs, the career of researchers, and the question of open access or open science. Uh, the University of Geneva participates in more than 30 of these uh, working groups. Through policy documents, declarations, and events, uh, this uh, group helps to shape policies at the European level. This is a mission that LIRU also fulfills uh, through lobbying activities directly with the European Commission. At the head of LIRU is the Assembly of Rectors, of which you are the president, Jean Chambois, while also being president of Sorbonne University. The meeting of this assembly are particularly popular with participants who see them as valuable opportunities to discuss with their peers the common concerns of their institutions. And... Um, 
Côte de Calité organizes uh, uh, with a great skill uh, these uh, meetings. Uh, the Diru has uh, many other advantages uh, which are particularly evident in difficult times. Uh, today it represents the support appreciated by universities in the UK while Brexit makes their future uncertain. A few years ago, Liru also functioned as an unexpected intermediary with the European authorities during the crisis experienced by the Swiss academic world following the acceptance in February 2014 of the so-called Against Mass Immigration Initiative. In particular, it enabled the universities of Switzerland, Geneva and Zurich, not to be completely excluded from European research programs, to be able to continue their collaboration, particularly within the, the prestigious uh, programs of the European Research Council. The uh, universities of uh, Geneva and Zurich are particularly grateful uh, to Liru for its uh, support uh, during this very difficult period, because it is always necessary to recall uh, the methods of academic work and their impact on our societies, and that it does so with so much conviction because it is always useful to share your experiences, whether good or bad, with your peers, and that it offers us this opportunity, because it defends the idea of an open and borderless science in a word that tends to be compartmentalized, because it ardently promotes a Europe made better by its universities, the University of Geneva Awards, the University of Geneva Medal, um, with recognition and pride to the European League of Research Universities, LIRU. Ready? <laughs> the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has today decided to award the 2019 Nobel Prize in Physics. La consécration pour la Suisse, pour Genève et pour son université. Le prestigieux reconnaissement sont les stades de Dès et Michel Mayor et la Genevrino Didier Kello. Le travail de Dès Didier Kello et Michel Mayor herzlich egal sein. Monsieur Kello, est-ce que vous pourriez montrer cette fameuse planète Oui, en fait, c'est une obscure série de chiffres. La seule chose qu'on peut faire, c'est détecter indirectement son influence sur l'étoile. C'est pas une découverte qui fait qu'un jour on dit « Ah ah, on a découvert une planète ». Quand on a confirmé... Oui, on a festoyé lourdement avec Didier Kello, on s'est acheté une tarte aux myrtilles, une bouteille de clairette de dille et on a fêté l'événement. J'étais un passionné de science avant tout. Là, on est en train de détecter une planète. Oui, presque. <rire> Ladies and gentlemen, you understood certainly that in the last few days, the universe, since the University of Geneva has its head in the stars. Thank you, Michel. Thank you, and Didier. It's an immense pleasure to me to invite Michel to join me on the stage. Our colleague, Didier Kudos would have loved to be with us today, but currently he is somewhere between Cambridge and Boston. He's not in search of an exoplanet. He's probably giving a conference somewhere. But he has given us a message, which you will see here.
Bonjour Michel, c'est une surprise. Malheureusement, je ne peux pas être avec toi et avec vous tous, mais je tenais absolument à m'associer à cet événement important de l'Université de Genève. Eh bien, 25 ans déjà, et quel cadeau Quel cadeau le prix Nobel nous a fait Quel cadeau il a fait à, pour notre travail, à tous les gens qui ont participé, au département d'astronomie, à la faculté des sciences, à l'Université de Genève, à la région lémanique, la Suisse, et à l'ensemble de tous les travaux qui se font dans le domaine des exoplanètes. Et je pensais que c'était vraiment important de, de le souligner et de le, et de le communiquer à vous tous ici présents. Et aussi, quel fantastique euh, euh, message d'espoir il donne euh, pour euh, finalement euh, des gens euh, quelque part euh, tout à fait normaux, hein, euh, quelqu'un qui fait ses études euh, euh, les écoles primaires comme moi à Genève, euh, un pur produit genevois du collège, euh, de l'université où j'ai eu le, le bonheur et la chance de te rencontrer et de travailler avec toi. Euh, puis après de continuer la recherche et, et, et de faire ce, ce résultat extraordinaire. Alors, euh, je voulais vous souhaiter à tous euh, une excellente matinée et euh, vous dire à, à quel point euh, cet événement est extraordinaire et je suis vraiment enchanté et heureux de le partager avec vous. Passez une bonne matinée à tous. Au revoir. Je vais limiter mes présents. I will just say, dear friends of the University of Geneva, to be brief, the first thing that comes to mind in seeing DJ here is a remark that a Spanish researcher made to me the other day. He said, it's amazing and wonderful to see that the Nobel Prize was given to someone who was in his only doctoral research when he made his discovery. So this is a message to all the young students in laboratories. Who knows, perhaps your work now will lead to uh, such wonderful results. You have to recall the history of the Nobel Prize. Uh, some, have been, some of it has been, unfortunately, forgotten. I think it's also interesting uh, to uh, really latch on to the, today's theme, diversity, diversity uh, in this university. And I'd also like to talk about the diversity in extrasolitary, extrasolar planetary system. 25 years ago, the, our naive idea was that surely there are some solar systems like ours, but they're probably very similar to, to ours. And in the last two decades, what we have seen is that there is a huge, vast diversity of planetary systems, planets uh, that have incredibly long or incredibly short orbits. Uh, so diversity. And I am very grateful to uh, and glad to see diversity, without which I would not be here. I'll try to be specific in that. The planet that we discovered, uh, Didier and I, 25 years ago, is a bit like Jupiter, but it has an orbit, the time it takes to go around its solar system, of only four days. And the theory was, before that, that this type of planet could not exist. It couldn't be shorter than 10 years. So it's only a factor of a thousand difference, based on what was predicted, but there you have it. So this is uh, nature's cleverness in creating uh, planets with such a short orbit. And there will be more discovered, but we certainly won't be here when that is done. As the rector said, I was in Spain recently giving conferences in a number of places, and then I received uh, m more than a, an encouragement and a very, very warm invitation from the rector saying that he hoped I would be able to be present. And I was given to understand by some of my colleagues in Spain that I should definitely attend. And in fact, I am really very happy to be here with you today. Just one final word then. I would like to express my gratitude both to the University of Geneva and also 
to the Swiss National Research Fund, which has supported us in our research for several decades. This stability, the, the trust that they placed in us, uh, it, it, we, we weren't given it uh, undeservingly. Uh, there was a lot of difficulty in uh, contradicting research that had already been done. And we have to remember that in the 1990s, there were four group, four pairs of people working on exoplanets. So this was not really a, a promising domain at the time, and yet we were still given support for it. And I would just like to close, uh, although I was not included on the original program, I'll be brief. I would just like to say thank you to all of you for being here today. Merci Didier. Thank you. Well, so we're going to remain with our head in the stars for a few more years. Absolutely wonderful. To close the ceremony, ladies and gentlemen, we will have the pleasure of hearing the Kletzmer Fantasy performed by Theo Fuschenere and Kevin Spagnolo. The musical interludes of our Dies Academicus uh, were chosen by the Geneva Competition, created in 1939 by the director of the Geneva uh, Conservatory, Henri Gagnobin, by a Viennese uh, uh, musician based in Geneva, Frederick Liebstokel. The Geneva Competition is one of the most important international musical contests. So what is its objective? Discover, promote, and support young talents, giving them the tools uh, to develop an international career. Theo Fouchenere and Kevin uh, Spagnolo both won uh, the first uh, piano and clarinet prizes, uh, respectively, in the 2018 edition of the competition. So this gives you an idea of their talent. Uh, born in Nice, uh, Theo Fouchenere trained in his hometown and then at the Paris Conservatory, where he obtained the highest distinctions. Invited by numerous festivals in France, Switzerland, Lebanon, China, and Japan, this young 24-year-old musician also devotes himself to chamber music and founded the Messiaen Trial. Originally from Luca, Tuscany, Kevin Spagnolo began studying clarinet in his hometown before continuing his training in Geneva. A curious and mischievous uh, musician, he has performed with many orchestras such as the Mahler Jugendorchester, the Verbier Festival Orchestra, or the San Carlo Theatre Orchestra of Naples. Before concluding in this ceremony in music, I would like to sincerely thank each and every one of our colleagues and collaborators, as well as all of our students, uh, without whom our university would not be what it is. Finally, I would like to express my sincere thanks uh, to the city and its authorities who support us uh, every day in all of our efforts. And now, let's hear the music. Thank you so much.
Merci à... Thank you, Theo and Kevin, for uh, using their talent today. It was a pleasure to see you again and to all turn our heads to the stars. I wish all of you a pleasant day. I'll be very happy to find you on the uh, ground floor where there will be uh, drinks. Uh, thank you very much.